if you don't cultivate the community within your own being, you're not going to have a community outside of you that's that's valuable and strong. Hello, Dharma Talk community. Welcome back to episode 007, episode 007 with special guest James Bond. Just kidding. It's with my friend, an even better guest, Michael Gu. I know Michael from teaching at Lighthouse Yoga School in Brooklyn. He taught my first ever, by the book, proper lead Ashtanga primary series class. So that is a memory I will cherish deeply in my heart forever. But what you should know about Michael is that he is super knowledgeable and passionate about yoga philosophy. Nevertheless, he does not let his scholarship get in the way of practical sense. He's a very practical person, very fun person, modern, and easy to connect with. I think this conversation really flowed naturally. Um, He has probably the most academically complete answer to my opening question, what does Dharma mean to you, of any of the guests I've had on so far. But after that, we do have a lot of fun talking about his personal background and story, too. We talk about responsibility as a two-way street and how we need to focus on giving while expecting nothing in return and what that does to breed a community. We also took, talk about this idea of putting your oxygen mask on first, that lesson they tell you in every airline safety video, and, um, and how that idea, that lesson, has turned a person who is decidedly a non-morning person into someone who wakes up at 3.30 a.m. every single day, except for full moon days. <laughs> we also talk about why it's important for every student to have a teacher, no matter how advanced or knowledgeable this student may think she is. And we talk about some strides that he's made in his career recently and some surprising lessons that he's taken away from them. So all of that is coming right up. Just stick around um, through the announcements. Hey, yogis. I just wanted to let you know that I've recently started recording some of the master classes and workshops that I'm teaching around the country and around the globe. And I'm putting them online on my website and they're totally free for you to access. Now, I know it's not the same experience as coming and taking class in person, but I know that's not possible for everyone, so I wanted to make this an option available no matter where you are. All you have to do to get access to my audio library is head on over to henrywins.com slash practice. That's henrywins.com slash practice. And there'll be a little box where you can drop your name and email address to get access to that page. So go check that out. I appreciate you taking a look and please enjoy. California yogis, I'm coming your way. On April 22nd, my wife Veronica Lambo and I will be teaching a joint workshop at Raw Yoga, the Costa Mesa location, and it's called Scorpion Hour, Invert Your Backbend. The scorpions are my absolute uh, favorite family of poses because they combine all the therapeutic benefit of backbending with inversions. So this is going to be a very fun workshop. You don't need to be a pro. You don't need to already have a handstand or anything like that. Um, come check it out. The event details are at henrywins.com events. What's your purpose? What's your vision? What mark will you leave on this planet long after you're gone? I'm Henry Winslow, and you're listening to Dharma Talk, the only podcast where I interview inspirational yogis on how they're changing the world in their own unique ways. Whether you're still searching for your purpose or already walking the path, I hope these stories get you excited to live your dharma. Hello, Dharma Talk community. Welcome back for another episode. Today, I've got my friend Michael Gu on. Michael is a level two authorized Ashtanga teacher in New York City. And in addition to running his My Store style teaching programs around the city, he's also a yoga philosophy fanatic that gives lectures from time to time, both requested and spontaneous. You can find his schedule and general musings about life on his website, sadhanainthecity.com. Michael, thanks for coming on. How are you doing today? I'm well. Thanks for having me. Of course. It's my pleasure to have you on. Um, So let's just jump right into the questions today. First, what does the word dharma mean to you? And what is your dharma as you understand it today? 
Um, well, Dharma is uh, is one of the the undefinables, or or maybe it's um maybe a better word for it is it's a multi-definable, which I don't know if that's actually a word or not. But um, just like the term yoga, it can be defined in so many different ways and has been defined in so many different ways over history that it becomes very difficult to put a word to it or a simple definition to it. Um, so if you if you look at uh, Sanskrit and the way the, the language works, um, words have roots and they're verbal roots. So the verbal root of Dharma is der, which ends with the vowel er, which we don't um, really have in English unless you're, no, you know, American and you just go er sometimes. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> um, but so that root um, is, is the same root for the word dharana, which is the sixth limb of Ashtanga yoga. And that root means to hold. Um, and so dharana um, is to hold something in the mind or to focus on something, to concentrate on something. So usually the sixth limb of Ashtanga yoga is translated as concentration. Dharma means to hold a uh, society or to hold um, cultural norms um, or to keep to a path. So sometimes it's translated as duty, sometimes as law, sometimes as a righteous path, sometimes as religious observance or religious ritual. Um, it can be, yeah, it can be translated many ways. And not only are we translating words when we're going from Sanskrit to English, but we're also translating culture. So we're going and we're diving into Vedic culture and pulling out a word like Dharma, and then we're trying to transport it over land and oceans and also the sea of time um, and place it here on, you know, in our culture on the American continent or wherever you're listening from. Um, so the translation becomes more and more convoluted and more and more difficult. Um, for me, right now, I am viewing Dharma as responsibility. I think that um, I have a great deal of responsibilities to other people. And other people also have responsibility to me. Um, you know, I have a responsibility to my family. I'm a teacher, so I have a responsibility to my students. I have a responsibility to the country that I live in, to the state that I live in, to the city that I live in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then all of these entities also have responsibility towards me. And so what happens eventually is because we all are responsible for each other, we all have duty towards each other, it creates a community. Like and this, that. oh, good. <laughs> you know, so, I, first of all, I just want to say that I, I was very excited to have you on and specifically to answer this question because... For those who don't know Michael, um, he is very much uh, a scholar of yoga, and I knew that you would have a very informed opinion about what this word means. So thank you for educating me and this audience about the multifaceted definition. Um, I didn't mean oh, to you're interrupt, welcome. but I, I just I wanted it's to correct. You know, we yeah, never know. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> of course, but also at the same time, everyone has a very personal experience and understanding of. Dharma, of course, but I think any word and anything that has a concept that's so rich behind it. So I appreciate you, you know, giving the, the overlying definition, but also sharing what it means to you personally in terms of responsibility and it being a two-way street. Oh, it's very much a two-way street. 
Um, and I think that, you know, some, unfortunately, I think that we have lost a lot of that two way street in our current culture. Um, I think a lot of times we are very concentrated on what someone else's responsibility is to us and not what our responsibility is to them. You know, we're a culture where we tend to take and take and take. Um, we really do have to concentrate a great deal on, on giving back. Um, even, you know, in a, in like a student teacher relationship in, you know, in a yoga, um, class relationship, if you're a student, you're, you're not there only to take from the teacher. You also are giving back to the teacher and giving back to the space and giving back to the community that has been created there. Um, otherwise, you know, it's a one way street and the one way street gets you gets you nowhere usually ends in a dead end so yeah where do you think that that trend toward entitlement and one-sided consumption is is coming from and um, you, I mean I, I think it, it kind of does result a bit from just capitalist society in general you know we're always looking to capitalize on something um, to get something bigger to get something better to take more um, so, uh -huh. yeah, I think it, I think it's actually part of our our culture, sure. which is why you have this like conflict between East and West, the ideas of the East, the ideas of the West. Um, and it can be very difficult to put them together to enmesh them, if you will. Sure. Yeah. You know, and I think in that paradigm of capitalism and um, and, and looking to take and, and create something for yourself. And even when you are giving, there is an intrinsic motivation there that you're going to be getting something in return. And I'm not necessarily sure whether that's a good or a bad thing, but I think there's truth to that for sure. Um, I'd like well, to. Well, yeah, I mean, that's uh, sorry uh, for cutting you off. No, go ahead. That's, um, <laughs> that's um, you know, that's talked about in the in the Bhagavad Gita a lot. Uh -huh. um, it talks a lot about karma yoga and you know karma yoga is when you do a selfless action when you when you do an action with absolutely no uh, desire for a result or no desire for the result that will happen you're, you're literally giving your actions up to God you're doing everything for God and of course in the Bhagavad Gita sense you know that supreme is is the idea of Krishna um, so yeah, this is like in the Shastra everywhere, um, this idea of you have to do actions, you have to do stuff, but you're, you should do them in a way so that you're not always expecting a return on your action. Yes, and yeah. that I know includes your yoga practice. That's yeah. Abhyasa Vairagya, right? Yes, yes, very much so. Practice and uh, dispassion or a non-attachment to that practice. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about your personal yoga practice. What is that looking like ah. these days and how is it supporting you on your path toward being a responsible contributor to society? Ooh, a responsible contributor to society. I don't know if anyone said that about me before, but thank well, you so much. I'm relating that back to your <laughs> dharma, so. <laughs> I try my best. I really do. <laughs> um, so my, my personal practice or my personal sadhana um, at the moment, uh, I get up uh, typically at 3.30 in the morning and I take my shower. Um, and that sounds a little personal, but it's, Im it's important. One should wash themselves before engaging in a practice, before engaging in a sadhana. You should wash not only your body, but as much as you can, you should wash your mind as well. Things should be clean. So that's one big reason we do, mo oh, not most, many people do their, their sadhana, their practice in the early morning, because the mind hasn't gathered the dirt of the day yet. So the mind is at its cleanest early in the morning. So wake up, 
take my shower. I go to the uh, yoga studio where I teach in the morning. And, you know, I, I light some incense and I wave that around and I do my little morning prayers, which are quite brief. Uh, and then I have a little cup of hot water for like five to ten minutes and kind of ponder my existence for a while. And then, <laughs> and then, and then, I, and then I do my asana pranayama practice, which is um, Ashtanga yoga, as it was taught by Sri K. Patabi Joyce. Um, and as it was taught to me by my teachers. So it's a very prescribed practice, you know, um, depending on the day of the week and depending on the cycle of the moon, I'm either doing primary series or intermediate series or advanced series. Um, and so it's, you know, it's a very prescribed thing that takes me, you know, about like an hour 15 to an hour and a half. Um, and usually I have a, I have a student who has a habit of coming into the studio about 545 and then another couple that come in, um, you know, six to 615 ish. Um, so the latter half of my practice, I actually have company for, which can be quite nice. And then I start teaching at 630. So that's what I do. Boom. In the morning, that's the first thing of my day. Usually the first word I say in the morning is Om, um, because I start with the traditional introductory chants to the Ashtanga practice. And so that's quite nice. And then um, I typically have a break in the afternoon. And so that's when I get to do my small little meditation practice, which is a, a mantra based meditation practice. And also my um, yoga sutra chanting and study or if I'm um, studying another text at the time, I get to study that at that time. And that afternoon is much more wishy-washy um, because it depends on how busy I am and how uh, stressed I am and what's going on in my life. So sometimes the afternoon stuff goes really well um, and it's really consistent. And other times that stuff kind of falls a little bit by the wayside. Um, but the morning, the morning is like where it's at. That is when I do my practice and, and I just get it done every day. Yeah. Well, well you know what I, I noticed when you're recounting through your, your average morning is that your practice blends seamlessly into your teaching. And, you know, you, you didn't really emphasize that, but I think that showcases your your dharma as as you identified it your your responsibility and oh yeah i mean something... if i'm if i'm going to be teaching people this practice i need to be practicing this practice there's no if ands or buts about that of course yes i i agree with you 100 percent on that but also just the fact that they are so seamlessly connected and they happen together it, it, was there a moment where you kind of realized that there is some response? Well, actually, let's talk about it from the way that you phrased it. You know, was there a moment where you realized that that was the most important thing um, to your ability to teach was that your practice continue yourself? Or is that something that you've always known? That is something that I was always told. My my teachers have always been very intense about that. Um, if you are going to teach, you must practice. Like there has never been any other option mm -hmm. as far as um, my education in yoga is concerned. Um, so I'm not sure there was like a specific time uh, that I was like, oh, wow, uh, yeah, I really need to like keep this practice or whatever to, to, um, to continue. I will say that it was eye-opening for me when I started my morning Mysore program down on, down on Bleecker Street, um, which has been running now for, I think, four years, uh, because that's when I first had to really start practicing alone. Um, I had, 
I'd practiced alone many times, but it was always like, you know, oh, I'm traveling, so I'm practicing alone. Or, oh, I can't make it to the shala today, so I'll practice on my own at some point, whatever. So they were like spotty uh, solo practices, if you will. Mm -hmm. And when I when I started this Mysore program, I was like, well, I I can't practice with people because when everybody's practicing, I'm teaching. So now I'm actually going to have to get up and go do my practice by myself. And I actually started doing practice after my students would, would do their thing. So I would teach until whatever it was, 9 or 9.30 in the morning. And then the room happened to be free. And so I would do my practice afterwards. Um, and eventually I flip-flopped it. And I was really happy when I, when I flip-flopped it because... Being able to do my practice first, get that done, and get all the benefit you you accrue from from doing a practice, that kind of clarity, getting all the the ick and the stress and the whatever out of your body, out of your mind, um, I think really, really helps me help my students. I can see that. Yeah. You know, you have to kind of fill up your own cup before you can pour out and serve others. Oh, most definitely. Yes. Must help yourself first, then you can help others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Put the oxygen mask on yourself first. Yeah. <laughs> oh, did you, you read that? <laughs> yeah, I read that. And I've, yeah. actually, I've asked that same question before to other people, not on this podcast, but just generally in, in conversations in life and use the same metaphor. So I appreciated you. Um, bringing that up. Oh, good for those for those who are listening that don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> um, so when you when you watch the in-flight video when you're on a plane and they play you the little video that you probably don't pay attention to about you know the emergency rafts and not wearing your high heels on the emergency rafts when you land in the water and all that stuff. There's a part about oxygen masks and you know if the pressure in the cabin changes the oxygen masks will drop. And they always say you have to put on your oxygen mask first before you can help, you know, the helpless child in the seat next to you, um, which I think is a great metaphor for, for everything, especially everything in an educational process. You have to educate yourself first. You have to do your own work first. Only then are you actually qualified to help anybody else with it. Yeah. You know, earlier you mentioned that um, this idea of having to keep up your practice in order to be a teacher um, mm -hmm. or to be you know, a respectable teacher, that was something that was impressed upon you by your teachers. Mm -hmm. So I do sense um, that you, part of this responsibility that you feel is to your, the ancestors of your lineage. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us maybe a little bit about, about that, about who your teachers are and, um, what responsibility you feel to them? Ah, so I feel personally extremely lucky. Um, I don't know why or how, but I fell in with like a really good bunch of people um, without me really trying at all. Um, when I first started Ashtanga here in, in New York City, um, I very quickly met John Campbell and Kimberly Flynn, who are both um, very respected teachers in the Ashtanga community. And they were teaching at, at a school that no longer exists, but one of them was teaching in the morning and one of them was teaching in the evening. And I was practicing in, in the evening because I actually started my Ashtanga practice practicing in the evening, which is, which is not ideal, but I don't like getting up in the morning. And as I said, I wake up at 3.30 in the morning now. I don't know how this happened, but uh, I've never been a morning person. I'm still not a morning person. My students know this. My students know that they probably just shouldn't talk to me until I've had that first cup of coffee. Um, <laughs> But uh, so so anyway, um, I was practicing in the evening and eventually one of the other one of the teacher's assistants, you know, Ashtanga has this um, 
in the in the Mysore setting, we have a tradition of having assistants in the room. That's really how you learn to teach the system is you assist someone who is uh, a teacher um, and you assist them for a long time. And so uh, one of the assistants approached me and said, hey, Kimberly needs an assistant. And I think you you could do it. And I was like, oh, really? OK, that OK, great. So. I then approached Kimberly and I, I, can't, I mean, I was so freaking nervous to approach this woman and like show her my credentials, which were so sad at the time. Um, you already uh, at this point? <laughs> what? I'm sorry. Were you already teaching yoga at this point? Yeah, but not Ashtanga yoga. I see. Okay. I was seeing like flow classes, vinyasa classes at a couple studios around around the city, uh -huh. um, and I was working. I was working full time in an office at that point. Okay. So yoga was like an addendum to my life. Right. Um. So anyway, so like approached her with like you know my little sad you know credentials. They involved like some sort of like two hundred hour teacher training and like where I taught and who I'd studied with whatever. Mm -hmm. Um. And she said, yeah, OK, I think we can do this. Um, so you'll come, you know, four times a week and you'll assist me in, in the evening. And then you'll practice on Friday. Friday in that shala was the last day of the practice week. So the last day of the practice week in Ashtanga Yoga, you always do primary series. It doesn't matter what series you're working on. Last day of the week, always primary series. So she said, look, you're only going to be assisting in primary series asana, so I need to see your primary series every week. So from that day forth, I started going in the morning and practicing with John in the morning. And then I would go to work all day. And then I would come back to the shala in the evening and assist Kimberly for two hours in the evening. And except on Fridays. And Fridays I would practice with her and she would like beat me. I mean, she would just tear me to shreds, um, which was wonderful, which was really wonderful. Um, so that eventually they both moved on to different places and I followed them. And so for a while, Kimberly was not teaching publicly. So I was assisting, I was practicing and assisting John. Um, and then I was doing all these other things on the side with Kimberly. You know, she has... Uh, a website. She has a YouTube channel that has over a hundred videos on it. I filmed most of these videos. I edited most of these videos on yoga and on all kinds of different things. Um, it's a uh, Kiki says, if, if you want to look it up, um, she goes by Kiki. Kimberly often goes by Kiki. Um, and so I was doing all of that stuff with her, which was like so super cool and awesome. And I'm so glad I had all of these experiences. And then they are the ones that eventually pushed me to go to India. Um, cause I, to be very honest, had no interest in going to India. Um, because I had everything I needed here. I mean, I'm in freaking New York city, you know, and I was studying with amazing, amazing teachers. So I was like, why go to India of all places? Um, but they pushed me to go to India, to go to the Shala in Mysore. And so I started to do that um, and get into that circuit. And once you s start going there, I mean, the amount of people you meet, the amount of connections you make, the amount of community uh, that you're accepted into it, it, it is absolutely, absolutely incredible. So, yeah, so that's kind of my history with that. Does that answer the question? I oh, yeah. I'm really sure. Okay, yeah. good. Well, first of all, I want to say that... <laughs> Um, I knew you had a little bit of a masochistic streak in you. I think we all do, all of us <laughs> who practice yoga every single day. Yeah. Um, and then as far as um, Kimberly's online stuff, I'll put a, a link in the show notes to that for the listeners who want to check that out. Um, oh, yeah, please. There's some good stuff in there. But then about, um, you know, your last point, that's really what I took away from your story is that you can think you have everything in front of you that you need, and maybe you do have you know, enough to be, we always have enough, right? But yeah, you're of course. open to yeah. new possibilities and new experiences. You don't know what's out there. And that's where, you know, it's, it's all about knowing what you don't know. I think that's the secret to continuing to learn always with anything, not just yoga. And this is why having, having a teacher and having a community is so important. 
because you can you can sit there for a very long time and think to yourself, I have you know all of this knowledge, I I have my practice, I'm doing my thing, like this is working for me, la 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 la, and you you can fall into a trap where you are not progressing anymore, and you don't realize that you're not progressing because you don't know what's out there. And so you need someone else. You need a, a teacher. You need a community or a lineage system to tell you, no, get yourself up, go and do this next step. Because a lot of times that next step can be scary and something you don't really want to get into. So you, you need a little, a little shove out of the nest, if you will. Yes, you know. yes. Dharma talk, community, if you are doing your home practice, Keep doing your home practice, but get out there and find a teacher who you can learn something. Yes. Find yeah. a teacher. That is, teacher is absolutely, absolutely essential. Absolutely okay. essential. Okay. Michael, can you take us to a moment where you face some resistance, either with your teaching or with your yoga practice? And it's okay whether it was resistance from an external source or whether it came from you personally inside. But what did you do with that, with that wall that you hit to get through it? Huh. Um, you know, my first trip to India uh, was very, very difficult emotionally. Um, so my best friend... And I went went to India. We uh, we bought tickets on New Year's Eve uh, because we we really felt we needed to do this. Um, we actually did not go to Mysore. We didn't we didn't go to the place where Ashtanga Yoga you know came from. Uh, we went to North India um, because the shala in Mysore was closed when when we at the time of year that we went. And so we went and, you know, we went to Delhi, we went to Agra. What? Was that a I'm surprise? Like that when you that it was there? closed? Yeah, that it was closed. No, we, know, we knew ahead of time. Like, okay. it, was, it was a timing thing. Like, they, they closed for months. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But we needed to go. Like, we needed to go. We kind of pushed each other to go. Um, so we got tickets, you know, and we kind of did this, like, little North Indian self-led tour and by ourselves and there were times when it was just uh absolutely emotionally devastating because you're in a foreign country you're in a foreign culture um a lot of the people either don't speak your language or don't speak your language that well or don't have an interest in speaking your language. And I certainly do not speak their language, languages. Um, and so you're kind of uh, adrift, you know, in the world with, with really nothing to do um, except just ponder your own existence, and that can be good for a little while, but like when you do that for three months, that gets really, really intense. Mm. Um, and so having my practice every day in India, which <laughs> eventually my friend and I, we started practicing separately because it was like too intense for us to practice in the same space together because we spent so much time together when we were in India. So we would actually go to like separate places um, to, to go practice by ourselves in the morning. Um, and that so makes having, sense to me. I mean, I, as yeah. an introvert, I definitely need to come back to my personal bubble from time to time to recharge. Mm -hmm. And I think yoga practice is a, is a big factor in that, but go on. Yeah. So having that, having my practice and, you know, I was in an area of India where they don't, they don't do, asana practice very much. Um, we were in Vrindavan for quite a while, which is kind of like a hotbed of, of, of Krishna worship. And so they do a lot of bhakti yoga there. They do a lot of chanting, a lot of kirtan, a lot of worship, a lot of puja. Um, but they don't do so much asana practice 
at all. In fact, they kind of, they would always kind of like giggle when, when we told them like that we did yoga asanas. They were like, oh, we don't, <laughs> we don't have to do asanas. We dance, you know, we dance in, in devotion to the Lord. Why would we need to do asanas? <laughs> uh-huh. So they always thought it was kind of funny that we, that we would wake up in the morning and do this stuff. Funny um, as in unfamiliar or funny as in like frivolous? Frivolous. Like why? <laughs> why do that when you're when you're cradled in the bosom of the Lord? Like why do you need to go bend your body into weirdo shapes? <laughs> uh, so yeah, yeah, Good funny question. And, yeah, like frivolous. <laughs> uh, so, but anyway, so like doing that, doing my practice there every day, what very much alone, um, in the country that this practice comes from, was very eye opening. That I think that's the first time I realized truthfully that the practice is really for me, you know, and it's my responsibility to do it. I'm not doing it because I can go to a yoga studio and have other people around me. I'm not doing it because my teacher told me to do it. I'm not doing it um, because I'm like indebted to someone else. I'm only doing it for me and my sanity and my health and my clarity. Um, so that, that was a really big shift, uh, for me personally, uh, that I got on that first trip to India. Yeah. And it's a fine line, I think, you know, because you do do the practice for yourself and for your sanity and for your well being. But that has fallout effects in your ability, you know, to leave a positive imprint on the rest of the world that you touch, right? Yeah, it's this it's the same thing we said earlier. You have to help yourself first and then you can help mm-hmm. others. You know, if I'm all crazy making and if I'm ill um, or unwell in general, I don't have any hope of of contributing. I don't have a a hope of being like a valuable member to society. Um, So I have to take care of that, that stuff. So so what is the the real uh, mind shift there? Is it a matter of knowing what the intention is? Like you have to be doing the practice for yourself, not skipping a step and saying you're doing the practice so that you can be a better teacher. And then that will just come as an unintended consequence. Is that your, your, your takeaway from that? episode uh yeah yeah i think so i think it's that i think it's a uh personal responsibility thing Mm -hmm. you know at the very beginning when you asked me about dharma and what it means i said for me right now it's a lot about responsibility and so you have responsibility to all these people and you know society etc but you have a responsibility to yourself. Uh, And so the practice for me has really become my responsibility to myself. And, and the, the understanding there is that if you don't fulfill the responsibilities to yourself, you are not going to fulfill, fulfill the responsibilities to everybody else. mm -hmm. And so if you don't have a relationship with yourself, you're not going to have a relationship with others. If you don't cultivate the community within your own being, you're not going to have a community outside of you that's, that's valuable and strong. Let those words sink in, people. This is, you know, I think this is a really common pitfall. Um, I, think, I don't know if it's especially in the yoga world, but it's certainly something that you see in the yoga world is that people run away to other people, other relationships to fill a void in themselves. But that is just a Band-Aid that's going to wear off. You have to get (laughs) yourself right first. Yeah, you see it it all the time. Uh, You really, really do see it all the time. And it's, it's a sad thing to watch happen. And I think the reason it's sad to watch happen is because you know you do it yourself Mm -hmm. because none of us are perfect. You know, none of us are 
are whole and complete yet in ourselves. That, that's a weird thing to say because we are fully whole and complete. We always have been. We always will be. But we don't truly realize it yet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or at least I don't. Maybe you do. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but but so you see it happen in other people and you see that reflection and you can go, oh, dear, like I'm I, I do that exact same thing mm -hmm. to whatever degree. And, and that becomes very frightening. Um, yeah, yeah, I think you it, know. Can, it can inspire <laughs> sadness. It can inspire fear, like you just said. But also a lot of the times um, when you get angry at someone, take a step back and look at yourself and say, OK, what in what is going on with that person that actually I'm just seeing a reflection of myself? Because half the time, at least, that's what's going on. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Okay. Michael, can you share one more story with us today, maybe a little bit more recent, potentially, of a major win that you've, you've uh, put under the belt recently that reaffirmed your conviction and yourself and the impact that you're making? What happened, and then what did you do with that success to take it forward? Well, so... Um... <laughs> I, this last, over the last year, maybe year and a half, I, I ended up almost unwittingly, willingly, not unwillingly, unwittingly, is that a word? Wittingly? Yeah, maybe, yeah. whatever, make up words. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of ended up becoming a, a traveling international yoga teacher, which is weird because I, I never thought that that would happen to me and certainly never thought that that would happen um, unless I like did a whole bunch of work to make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, but over the last year and a half or so, I've gone to Ecuador, I've gone to Panama twice, I've gone to South Korea twice. I just came back from Thailand. Um, and all of these things happened because I have been um, providing space for community to happen around me. Um, and so through that community, I've actually, I've had, I had students approach me and say, hey, I'm a, I'm a teacher, you know, in my own right, and I do these programs, and I want you to come and teach in these programs, you know, uh, around the world. And all I had to do was just say, Okay, sure. I'll I'll book tickets and then we'll like, you know, deal with the little financial nitty-gritty and that'll be it. And it was so amazingly easy and simple. Mm -hmm. Um and I I just never thought it would be that way. I always thought it was going to be like such a struggle. Like if I wanted to travel and teach, I was going to have to contact people and set stuff up and deedly 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 dee. No, I just sat back and I did my teaching here and I did it to the best of my ability every day and then poof things just happened and all of a sudden I'm traveling around and I'm and I'm teaching and I'm having a lovely time doing it it's it's really quite amazing so I guess that's not so like so super specific um it's okay it's that's okay not like a moment in time but but that is what's been been happening to me and you know they they have a there's a a metaphor that's often used um when you're talking about uh, deep states of concentration because deep states in con of concentration when you're talking about the last three limbs of ashtanga yoga dharana dhyana and samadhi these meditative states um, you cannot force them to happen. They happen all by themselves. The only thing you can do is set up the parameters for it to happen. And it's just like growing a, a plant. You cannot force a plant to grow. You can take a seed, you can put it in the dirt, you can make sure that that dirt is in a sunny place. You can water the dirt appropriately. And then eventually the seed will grow all by itself and it will blossom 
all by itself without all you had to do was set up the correct parameters. And so, so that's what I'm seeing happen in my life now. It's like I've been doing this long enough so that I've set up the correct parameters for long enough that things are starting to just happen spontaneously, just like it seems like flowers spontaneously come out of the earth when we go from winter to spring. Yeah. You know, when you first said that you didn't have to do any of that work that you thought you'd have to do, contacting people, arranging the logistics. Well, no, you didn't at the time, but actually yeah. you've done all of that <laughs> by building all of these, you know, meaningful, uh, selfless relationships with people. Oh, I wouldn't call them selfless, Henry. Don't <laughs> give me that much cred credibility, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm no karma yogi. <laughs> like fine, that fine. Not. maybe not selfless, but you built these relationships without the intention of of reaping this particular reward with any you know consideration down the line. Right, right. You build the relationship. You have these relationships, and those relationships will be valuable to you as long as you take care of them. And but the taking care of it process is is super important. Like you have a duty to your students and your students have a, a duty to you um, just like you have a duty to your parents and your parents have a duty to you and etc 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 you can kind of go as big or as small as as you want to but that's when you're talking about dharma like that's what we're really talking about you want to lead you want to like uphold law you want to you know be on the righteous path well look at where your responsibilities are and are you fulfilling your responsibilities? You have to ask yourself that all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's in, in my time right now, it's 10.50 a.m. It's I guess that means 11.50 a.m. in New York for you. That means yes. your day, you've been up teaching, practicing for hours. Oh, no, 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 no. It's the full moon. Oh, okay. All right. So unusual day for you. Unusual well, day. I got up at 9.30 this morning. Look at that. Sleeping in. Life of luxury. Right? Yeah. Super luxurious today. Yeah. Full moon. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, if you practice Ashtanga in the traditional sense, um, you, you do not practice physically on the full moon or the new moon. So today being the full moon, I, I have the day off. I'm not teaching. I am not doing any asanas. Not happening. I'm just sitting on my sofa. Well, in that case, I appreciate you making a slight exception and, <laughs> um, and, and getting your message out on this podcast today. Uh, I no problem. The, the tradition of your practice very seriously. Oh, well, you have to, don't you? Of I course. mean, if you're, if you're going to be in this world, this world takes, it gives so much, but it takes quite a lot as well. You know, it's really hard work. This, this yoga thing is very, <laughs> very hard work. Um, and and it's got to be more than about, you know, the body. Um, because if I wanted a, like, if I wanted a beautiful body, I would, I would go to Chelsea and hire a trainer or maybe Hell's Kitchen and hire a trainer. You know, mm -hmm. I know a couple guys, they would make me gorgeous. Um, but, and it would be much easier than what I do now physically, honestly. Um, and I wouldn't have to get up at three freaking 30 in the morning to do it either. So if you're going to, if you're going to do this work, if you're going to put forth this effort to do this yoga, there has to be something bigger that you're looking at. You know, it has to be about the mind. It has to be about connection with yourself and connection with with other people who are also seeking these same things. Otherwise, it is way, way too much work to put in. Uh, yeah, yeah. And at a if you're just looking level, at the... At a broader level, just always be asking yourself why you're doing the things you're doing. Don't just slip into routines and, um, and let them be just that, mindless routines. Routines right. are good, but you should know why you're doing them. Most definitely. Ask and ask your teacher why you're doing it. Again, get a teacher. Ask them why you're doing this this routine every day. You know, yeah. they sh they should be able to help you with that. They should be able to give you counsel when when the going gets rough. Because 
the going is going to get rough, really rough. Um, that is guaranteed. There are also going to be like lovely, wonderful, like grass filled meadows with butterflies and stuff and that sort of thing um, on, on your little journey. But, you know, at some point, things are going to get real bad. Uh, that, that, that is simply a guarantee. Yoga's hard. Yoga's End of hard. sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good time now to move on to the prana round, Michael. Okay. So at this section of the interview, I'm going to ask you six questions and ask you to answer in at least one word, at most one sentence. You ready to go? I think so. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in one word, why do you practice yoga? Ah. Uh, discipline. What's your favorite yoga pose and why? Mm, Paschimottanasana. It is the asana I have cried the most in and also the asana I have laughed the most in. It's a whole emotional roller coaster. Oh, yes. <laughs> What's the single best cue or general piece of advice you've ever received from a yoga teacher? <laughs> Don't waste your time. It's okay. the only thing that all the great gurus agree on, except that coffee should be taken very hot with milk and a lot of sugar. <laughs> Don't waste your time and don't waste your coffee, people. Yes, there you go. Exactly. Recommend one book, modern or ancient, for our audience. Ah, um, Agora, At the Left Hand of God by Robert Svoboda. Okay. Is yoga for everyone? Liberation is guaranteed. The amount of time it takes is up to you. So everyone will have to practice yoga eventually. Mm. So yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Maybe not this life, maybe yeah. next. Okay, Michael, how can our audience get in touch with you and how can we support you in your dharma? Um, well, I mean, the best thing to do is, is start a yoga practice. Um, you know, you can come practice with me if you live in New York, or you can find a credible teacher wherever you are, and then you'll kind of like be whisked into the community that I'm part of, even though I may not even know you. Um, but if you want to, you know, practice with me or actually contact me, probably the easiest way is to go through my website, um, which has three addresses. It's either sadhanainthecity.com, Michael Gu com or bleaker street ashtanga.com they will all direct you to the same place you can email me through that you can see my schedule through that you can you know find my instagram page through that anything you want fantastic michael it's been such a pleasure to have you on the show can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing your wisdom and i'll see you around new york sounds great henry see you soon if you got something out of this episode, if you like Dharma Talk and want to keep it going, please do me a huge favor and subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. I know it's not the most convenient thing to do, but it makes all the difference in getting the show out there and more visible to other people who can benefit from it. And hey, if you've got feedback or ideas or you want to get in touch with me, you can do that on Instagram at Henry Wins. Otherwise, I'll talk to you next week. And until then, Keep living your dharma.